It's the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. But it's not just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast. It's a finished strong Friday. Haven't said that in a while. I'll be saying that all season long once we go daily, which I guess is just about what? nine days away, 10 days away from this show being daily. Tell everybody you know that if they want the best 30 minutes of on-demand audio or video content to keep up with what's going on in the NFL, this is the show. This is what you have to listen to or watch. Those of you that do watch on YouTube, youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL can tell I'm not at home in Pennsylvania. I am in a hotel room in Miami. Because tomorrow night, I'll be on the broadcast of the Philadelphia Eagles and the Miami Dolphins, the final preseason game for both teams. Looking forward to it. Although yesterday, I came down for the joint practice and the Dolphins were not able to do it because they're having some stomach issues. They got a stomach bug, so they didn't want it to spread. Uh, I want you to spread the word about the Ross Tucker Football Podcast at Ross Tucker NFL. I'll let you know the winners for this week because I got a bunch of winners a little bit later in the show. I like to get to my boy Greg when I have my boy Greg. It's the civilian goat. It's Big Show time. The Big Show. You know him. You love him. You follow him on social media at Greg Cosell. He is the absolute man on so many different levels. Uh, you know, he's on every week, and it's our most popular episode because you guys love the wisdom that Greg provides. Greg, there's a lot to get to. Uh, you know, I actually want to start with, uh, you know, your longtime role at NFL Films. I feel like you are as qualified to talk about these first two guys as anyone. And we'll start with the passing at, at age 87 of former Chiefs quarterback and Hall of Famer Len Dawson. I mean, obviously, uh, Greg, before my time, uh, but I'm curious what what you can tell us about Len as a player. I don't know if you ever interacted with him as a person when he was doing Inside the NFL or whatever, but just your thoughts, Greg, on the great Len Dawson. Yeah, I did know Len Dawson. Worked with him at times. Uh, really a great, great guy, number one. That's most important. But in the context of um, the 1960s, you have to think of it this way, uh, Ross. In the 1960s, what was the NFL about? The NFL was about Vince Lombardi, the running game, tough defense. That's what everyone in the NFL aspired to be. You had to beat the Packers. Everybody wanted to be the Packers in terms of style. So then you had this upstart league, the AFL, and they were looking for a place and they did not want to be the NFL. So what what was the AFL's approach? And by the way, I was a huge AFL fan growing up. Uh, they, they decided they were going to throw the ball around. They were going to play differently. And Len Dawson was part of that. Now, that doesn't mean you didn't run the ball at all. For people who do know history and the AFL's history, there were many great backs in the AFL in the 60s, but it was much more of a passing league. And the numbers that quarterbacks put up, including Len Dawson, he led the AFL in touchdown passes. I know at least once. It could have been twice. Um, I think he threw over 30 touchdowns a couple of times. That was unheard of for the most part in the NFL. There were exceptions, obviously, Y.A. Tittle. But Len Dawson was, was in that context, and he was a great quarterback uh, within the context of that league with a receiver like Otis Taylor, who I believe is in the Hall of Fame as well. Um, but Len Dawson was a, was a really, really good quarterback uh, on a really good Chiefs team, one of the main reasons they were really good. You know, Greg, it almost sounds silly now that, like, the NFL didn't want to throw the ball and that the AFL is like, well, we'll start a league and we'll throw the ball. I mean, I, you know, knowing what the NFL has become now, that just seems so backward. And look, not that you can't have a lot of success running the football. And there's a lot of teams we talk about all the time, Greg, who their offense is based on the run game. Absolutely. But I, I guess I'd, I'd be curious to hear, you know, what some of the NFL coaches in the 60s, I, I guess they just thought um, 
they weren't as efficient throwing the ball. Maybe I think there were more interceptions back then, more incompletions. It just wasn't yeah. as precise as it is now. No, and this is a, a long conversation, Ross. I know you're a fan of history in general, uh, certainly based on your college background, but um, we can't get into it now. But it, 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 in the East Coast and through the Midwest back in that era, for the most part, for the most part, as I said, there's always exceptions. Football was about physicality, toughness, run the ball, play defense. The West Coast, and this goes even back to the 50s, the West Coast was more expansive in its thinking. I don't know if that's a result of, you know, societal and cultural issues, you know, the new frontier, all that stuff. Well, you could probably write books on this. Um, but the West Coast was more about passing. They were more expansive thinkers. That's Bill Walsh came out of that, but he he came out of it. There were many names before him that were throwing the football. And, and so the West Coast was really somewhat of the starting point for the passing game, which probably leads us uh, into another uh, individual. Yeah, that's so funny. I, I honestly was, since you brought that up about Len Dawson, that's what I was thinking about. That's what I was talking about. And then all of a sudden, as you're talking, I'm like, man, this is going to be a great segue for Don Coriel being named uh, yeah. a finalist for the Pro Football Hall of Fame in the coach contributor category, the former coach of the Cardinals, as well as the San Diego Chargers, who, man, there's a lot of people that I really respect in football, Greg, that they just hold him in such high yeah. regard it's unreal yeah well he, he, and he's a fascinating story because i'm going to give you a very quick story about coriel and his background coriel was initially a john mckay acolyte he was a run game guy early in his coaching career a lot of people might not know that then he got the head coaching job at san diego state and back then san diego state played all the pack eight schools it was the pack eight then and the pack eight would run the ball yeah, you know, they got all the, the big guys, you know, obviously the recruits. They got the, the defensive linemen, the offensive linemen. And Coriel said, how can I compete? I'm playing these Pac-8 schools. How can I compete? I can't compete because I'm not going to get those guys. So the only way I can compete is to spread it out and make it much more of a track meet and try to neutralize the size advantage they have and the size disadvantage that I don't have, that, that, that I face. And back then, you could take a transfer and he could play immediately. So you could bring in a kid on Tuesday and he could play on Saturday. So what did Coriel do? He, he started with the passing game, which now everybody remembers San Diego State quarterbacks like Dennis Shaw, Brian Seip. Um, and he could bring transfers in. So he created the three-digit system in the pass game. He was the one who created it because it was easy to bring a receiver in on Tuesday and say, okay, you're going to run three routes this week on Saturday. We're going to a nine route's going to be a go route, an eight route's going to be a post route, and a six route's going to be an in route. That's all you need to know. And we're going to call the routes from left to right. So you're going to line up on the left. So the first number is your route. That's easy to learn. So he created the three digit system out of necessity. Greg, I never knew that. That is awesome. That just so people know, like that's how they call it, right? Like it'll be yeah. like uh, um, two jet, whatever, or like the, you know, they it's have like a, the numbers in, the, in 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 that offense. You know, you know, nine eighty nine. You know, that's yes. that's the three routes, and then obviously there's tags and alerts. You know, everything expands. But so with Coriel, what you get into Ross is you get into winning versus impact on the game of football over a long, long period of time. Many will just look at Don Coriel and say, well, he never got to a Super Bowl. He never won a Super Bowl. Not a Hall of Famer. You know, he, that's what people say about quarterbacks as well. That reduces a, a player's career or a coach's career and influence to a mathematical equation. If you want to do that, that's OK. But Don Coriel's impact and influence on the game of football is still felt today. That offense still exists in the NFL. People run the Don Coriel offense. And it will, it will always exist. All right. So I want to take a step back, Greg. I know you've been in NFL films for 43 years. How do you know, like, that San Diego State story about yeah. Coriel? Like, how do you know all this stuff, the John McKay and all that? Well, 
you know, I, I'm, I'm intellectually curious and I like to read and I talk to a lot of people. And I actually wrote a book with Ron Jaworski about 10, 11 years ago called The Games That Changed the Game. And in that book, we did a chapter on uh, Don Coriel, and it was much more about his use of Kellen Winslow because Joe Gibbs was on his staff with the Chargers. And it was actually Joe Gibbs who was responsible for creating Kellen Winslow because at that time, tight ends were attached players and they drafted Kellen Winslow and they realized, why do we have this freakish athlete who's an unbelievable receiver? And why are we lining him up next to the tackle? So DNs and linebackers can just beat the crap out of him and he can't get into his routes. Why don't we, detach him from the formation and have him use his athletic ability. And back then there were not multiple defenses as there are now. So teams either played a form of zone or man. That's it. You know, there were no combinations. So Winslow would either get a linebacker or a safety and he was a mismatch for both. Wow. That's an all. I, I love stuff like this. I I'm, I am a nerd when it comes to stuff. Like, I'm a football nerd. When it comes to stuff like this, I absolutely love that. Those are great stories. I appreciate it. Um, so anyway, right. the bottom line point is I personally believe, given Don Coriel's impact on the game tactically and conceptually, which is still continuing, I think he deserves a place in the Hall of Fame. Yes, I know he didn't get to a Super Bowl. I know he didn't win a Super Bowl. But the respect and the reverence with which he is held by people in the business. You know that. You started by saying that, Ross. That is really high, high level. Speaking of deserve, Greg, does Kenny Pickett deserve to start the opener for the Steelers? Well, all, all I can say is, you know, look, this is not a cop-out answer. I personally believe that he does deserve – deserve is not the right word because we're not there every day. So that's, that's what we don't know. But – I will say this. I, I really liked Kenny Pickett's tape coming out of pit. I've liked what I've seen. It's preseason, yes. And 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 I always I'm not a big preseason guy in terms of making defining decisions about players. Um, because I think for coaches, practice and day to day is more important than 10 snaps or 15 snaps in a game, as you well know. So I, I don't I don't want to, you know, say, oh hey, he's looked good in, in 35 snaps, he should start. So I don't know what's happening day to day. But think of it this way. They signed Mitchell Trubisky to a two-year deal, not a big money deal. It pro it's probably really a one-year deal, I would imagine, when all said and done. And they chose to draft Kenny Pickett in the first round. I think that tells you – I think they're telling you, Ross, what they think of Trubisky. You know, that, that if they have to play him, they'll play him because he has started in this league. And given that they have a workhorse back they and a really good defense, I'm sure they feel they can line up and can, and can compete. But I don't think you draft a quarterback with the 20th pick in the first round with the idea that this guy's not going to be my starting quarterback. Yeah, it's. Uh, it, I think it's pretty clear, Greg, that Trubisky probably is on borrowed time and – you know, you, I, I, I would be surprised they sort of pick it in the opener. They might, but it feels to me like you can go with Trubisky, and as long as he's playing well and you're winning, great. As soon as he's not, I, I don't think he's going to have a very long lead. Yeah, and, and my sense is Pickett being 24 years old, and, you know, from what I know about Kenny Pickett, I, I, I have not met him, uh, but I know his, his personal quarterback coach pretty well. I don't think there's an issue with Pickett mentally. In other words, they open in Cincinnati. Let's say he did start, and let's say he didn't have a great game. My sense of Kenny Pickett is that he's not going to be broken mentally. I think he's, you know, and you probably know this too, you know, he's a very mature kid that's not going to ruin his career. No, I mean, he, and you said he's 24. He's been through a lot at Pitt. I mean, yeah. he's, he's not your typical, I mean, a lot of these guys now are 21 when yeah. they come into the league. Uh, he is certainly not that. In fact, I don't know. Malik Willis is pretty young. Uh, we got a chance to see Malik a second time now. Um, what did you see? Did you see growth? Did you see improvement from week one to week two for Willis, Greg? I would say not on tape. I've heard he's done better in practice um, from people down there. But I think the tape still shows a, a player that has, you know, a road to go. Again, you never know how quickly or how slowly the process is. But he has he has much work to do, and it's fundamental work. Um, 
we know he can throw the ball hard. We know he can run. We know he can make a special play here and there. Um, we saw that in the last game when he made that sidearm throw. You know, he can do that. Um, but he needs better control of his throws. He doesn't really throw with any sense of pace and touch at this point. He's a fastball pitcher. Um, his footwork, his lower body mechanics really need a lot of work. He, he's not ready to deliver the football very often once he drops and sets. And when you're not ready with your lower body, Ross, to deliver the football, what happens is you end up rushing your upper body and you lose ball placement, you lose accuracy. So he has a ways to go. Uh, look, we know he's not the starting quarterback, although I personally believe that if something were to happen to Tannehill, they would want Willis to be the guy who comes in. I don't think they want him to be the number three. I think they want him to be the number two, which is why I think he's gotten so much time in the preseason. Curious what you think about what's going on in Washington, Greg, where it seems like Brian Robinson yeah. you know, might be beating out Antonio Gibson as the starting running back. Now, listen, I don't follow it as closely you know i don't study these guys on tape like you know i always thought antonio gibson was pretty good i i, I don't really understand where this is coming from i guess it's the fumbles well i mean i would i would say based on tape i think brian robinson is, is a better runner than than antonio gibson um i really like robinson coming out of alabama with backs you never know about draft location i mean he was a fourth round pick uh, but that doesn't mean a lot the way backs are drafted in today's nfl Robinson's 225 pounds. I think he improved significantly his last year at Alabama. He showed some stop and start. He showed more quickness. Um, like I said, he's big. I think, to me, Robinson down the road could even be a three down back. He, he's a good receiver. He's a good blocker in pass protection. I just think Brian Robinson is a better back than Antonio Gibson. And the way this is developing, Ross, I'm not surprised at all. I had mentioned to someone six, eight weeks ago that I thought when it when it all shook out that Brian Robinson would be the starting running back. So what's what's the issues with Gibson? I think Gibson is pretty straight line. Um, I don't think he has a real good feel for working in confined space. Um, I think he's big and fast. That's what he is. Uh, but I don't think he has a natural feel as a runner. Don't forget his last year at Memphis, he was essentially a slot receiver. I mean, he carried the ball, I don't know how many times, somebody will know the answer to that, but I don't think he carried the ball more than 20, 40 times. And he had some big runs because he's fast. Um, so he's straight line fast and he is big, but he's not really um, a nuanced kind of runner. And I, I guess he's had some fumbling problems too. And that will get you, as you know, Ross, on the bench in a heartbeat. So speaking of guys that are big and straight line fast, I wanted to get your thought. I'm down here in Miami. I'll be calling yeah. the game tomorrow night. There's all kinds of talk about uh, franchise tag tight end Mike Gesicki yeah. being on the trade block. And Mike McDaniel, the head coach, did not deny it. He said, listen, there's lots of conversations that go on. You know, I think it's misleading to say he's on the trade block. They have him playing late into preseason games, Greg. He's never... I watched him at Penn State. He's never been a good blocker. He never really seems like he wants to do it, but he's big. He's got tremendous body control. He's got really nice hands. Is he just not a good fit for what the Shanahan system likes to do? Should he go somewhere else, Greg, and just be a detached tight end or a slot yeah. receiver? It, it, it just seems like it might not be a good fit for him. It's a great philosophical coaching question because I'm sure there are some coaches who would say, hey, you've got this guy in Gusecki who's got a pretty darn good skill set at what he is. So as a coach, do you have to find a way to make that work? And the flip side of that is, hey, as a coach, you have a strong belief in your system. That system has been highly, highly effective in the NFL because Mike McDaniel comes from the Shanahan School. In fact, I think he's been with Kyle every year of his NFL career until this year, obviously. Uh, so that's a great philosophical question. People will come down differently on, on that. The, but if you're going to run the Shanahan system, Gusecki is not a good fit. Um, he's not an inline blocker. Um, they have 
you know, if everybody's healthy, they have three quality receivers. Hill, Waddle, they signed Cedric Wilson, who I thought had an outstanding year with the Cowboys last year. So Gusecki, in a strict sense, does not fit. Keep in mind, last year, Miami, because they lacked weapons, they essentially used Gusecki as a wideout. But he's not really a wideout. Just because he's big and he has body control and can go up and get it, he's not a true wideout. Because Miami last year, if I'm not mistaken, lined up either the most or second most snaps with two tight ends on the field. And Gusecki rarely lined up attached. He was always split or detached. So, yes, he is not a good fit. Um, What that means as far as if he goes somewhere else, that would not surprise me. Check him out on social media at Greg Cosell. He is the man. You guys all love him. I love him. You can always watch him as well. YouTube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, Ross. And thank you, Babbel. Yes. Love when we get a new sponsor. Babbel is the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions. You guys have already heard of it. And here's what's awesome. You only need 10 minutes to complete a lesson. So you can start having real-life conversations in a new language in as little as three weeks. They're not using AI for their lesson plans. Their lessons were created by over 150 language experts. And what's awesome is people are traveling internationally again. Bri just went to Italy with his son and loved it. If you're traveling internationally again, or even if you just are, at, like Greg Cosell, intellectually curious, When you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. So you're getting six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use promo code ROSS. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com code ROSS. Tux Takes. Hey, Ross. Good morning. Let's start with, uh, I guess, the big news. The biggest news uh, besides Len Dawson. We'll get to him in a second. Cowboys, left tackle, Tyron Smith, significant hamstring injury. He is out indefinitely. This is this this is probably going to be a bad year for the Cowboys. I mean, first of all, I feel terrible for Tyron. He, he has not been able to stay healthy. His body has been breaking down on him for years now. He should strongly, this is me, not him, his life. If I were him, I would strongly consider never playing football again. Between his back and his neck and his ankle and everything else, he's made a ton of money. And these things don't go away. You know, like I'm sitting here in this chair in my hotel and my my back hurts. Like he should strongly consider stopping playing football. I, I think I think his body is trying to tell him something. So that's the player perspective for you. From the Cowboys. I mean, they moved on from Lael Collins, so now their swing tackle, Terrence Steele, is the starting at right tackle. They don't have a swing tackle to play at left, so they're really worse at both positions. You know, they trade they they trade Amari Cooper, and then they also, as you noticed, you know, Greg just talked about Cedric Wilson. The Cowboys have made a lot of poor decisions this offseason, and unless Dak Prescott and, like, Micah Parsons go nuts this year, I think they're going to take a step back and maybe a significant one. Tux takes. Uh, really cool conversation you and Greg had about Len Dawson and Don Coriel. Obviously, Dawson passed away at the age of 87, and Coriel named a finalist for the uh, NFL Hall of Fame. I don't know how much I can add to this. Oh, I, Hall of Fame, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know how much I can add to this other than saying I hung out with Len Dawson uh, one night. It was at the Rookie Symposium. I don't remember where it was, but I was a moderator at the Rookie Symposium for the NFL, and it was like me and Bruce Allen and Len Dawson, just like drinking and talking. It was wild. I mean, I don't know, I don't know how the three of us all were sitting next to them, but that was like the trio, me, Bruce Allen, and Len Dawson. That sounds like a joke, like, all right, so Bruce Allen, Len Dawson, and Ross Tucker walk into a bar. And then, um, so anyway, that, that was my only interaction with him ever. Uh, but it was it, it was fun to hang out with him that night for sure. He had some great stories. Tux takes. I was talking about uh, what's going on 
in camp. Aaron Donald swinging helmets at the Rams versus Bengals joint practices. And as you alluded to earlier, the Dolphins cancel their joint practice against the Eagles due to that stomach bug. Okay, so let's start with the Aaron Donald. He had two different Bengals helmets in his hands, and he was swinging them. That is extremely dangerous. I've told the story before about Lamar, uh, LeVar Arrington swinging my helmet at my head. Um, it's not good. And they say that because it wasn't during a game, the NFL can't discipline him. I wonder if the Rams do something because they, ha- you know, the NFL tells them they have to. Maybe it's a fine. Maybe he's suspended for a week that he doesn't feel like practicing anyway. I don't know. But I feel like they might have to do something in that regard. Um, by the way, probably not the best idea to have the two teams that played in a hotly contested Super Bowl then practice against each other six months later when you know the team that lost obviously has something to prove and they've been thinking about it every day for six months. Maybe not the best idea. As for the Dolphins canceling the joint practice, um, that was obviously um, – a, a major bummer, uh, major bummer. And because I flew down here yesterday morning, got up at 2.55 a.m., which is why we didn't have the Ross Tucker football podcast on Thursday because I flew down here because I was excited about the joint practice. Uh, at this point, I just hope that the Dolphins are feeling better and that, you know, the, the stomach bug hasn't spread more and that they're able to play the game tomorrow night because I really want to call the game. I'm down here. So hopefully the Dolphins are okay. They probably did the right thing, not having all those guys around each other anymore if they've got something that's contagious and spreading. Tux takes. Uh, a couple of news items. Giants wide receiver Colin Johnson tears his Achilles and Ravens sign wide receiver Demarcus Robinson. Right. And I saw, um, Bri, where Malcolm Butler uh, was released from the Patriots IR with an injury settlement, which means... If you, if you don't know, it's like, okay, let's say he's got um, an eight-week injury. They'll pay him for eight weeks, and then he goes off their IR, and he's a free agent. Now, he actually can't sign with a team until that settlement's over. You can't kind of double dip on that. So he can't play until the length of the settlement's over. But he basically went to New England, got a signing bonus, got an injury settlement, and then left. So um, that didn't work out, uh, to say the least. Then you've got Demarcus Robinson, who I always thought Demarcus Robinson was a good player. I I mean, I I always thought he was a pretty good receiver. I'm actually surprised he didn't move up the ranks with the Chiefs and wasn't like one of their top three receivers this year. There must be something missing there, but I, I think the Ravens are a good fit for him. And then that's a shame for Colin Johnson because he'd actually played really well in camp and was going to be a factor for the Giants this year. They've they've already suffered some bad injuries. Tux takes. And let's end it here with uh, two games last night. Your thoughts, Chiefs Packers and Texans Niners. So uh, Chiefs Packers, uh, the, the Len Dawson tribute on the first play with Mahomes was really cool, really poetic. I, I appreciated it. Um, and I, I know Matt LaFleur said Jordan Love did some good things. I, I don't know, man. Um, I saw some really, really poor throws, really poor throws from, uh, from Jordan Love. Let's put it this way. He's not ever going to be Aaron Rodgers, that's for sure, and probably wasn't that smart to go ahead and have him out there or, or to draft him like they did. As for... The game, Matt Bushman had an awesome night for the Chiefs as a backup tight end. Then he then he ter- he fractures his clavicle. Unbelievable. The highest of highs and the lowest of lows for him. I feel awful. And I thought Tyler Goodson really looked good for the Packers. Meanwhile, in that Texans Niners, this Damian Pierce guy, I mean, he looks like the real deal. Damian Pierce, you know, Joe and I were talking about him on the Fantasy Feast podcast. If you play fantasy, you absolutely need to watch that show and uh, or listen to it. And we were talking about him. Man, he was very, very impressive. And I thought the picture quality on uh, Amazon Prime was great. 
I had it up on my laptop. I had the game on NFL Network in the hotel here, and I had the Texans Niners on my laptop. Thought the picture quality was awesome. I think you guys are all awesome, all of you, but especially those of you that go the extra mile. How about Larry Langston? Five-star review on both Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Really appreciate that, Larry. You're the Spread the Word winner as a result. All you have to do is give the five-star review real quick, screenshot it, and then email it to me, ross at rostucker.com. Larry, let me know. I got some awesome press passes, signed cards, signed pictures, whatever you want. Brennan Burke took advantage of the code that we have for you guys at ExpressVPN, which is very apropos with me being on planes and hotels. Thank you, Brennan. Same deal. Let me know what you want. And then Chris Parker is the YouTube shout-out winner, youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. So cool to see the best highlight clips of any of our shows on our YouTube page. Really, a lot of people just like checking out some of the different videos we have on there. Chris, let me know who you would like me to give the cameo-style shout-out for. Just send it to me, and I'll I'll record it from down here. I love doing it. Shout-outs, by the way. To Pizza Boy Brewing, Sportaculture, HumanHeadNYC.com, SteakhouseSports.com, Go-Bangles.com, Evergreen Economics, and MyFrontPageStory.com. We will be back bright and early Monday morning with both College Draft, getting ready for week one of college football, and how about Dan Orlovsky? on the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Should be awesome. Have a great weekend, everybody. I think we're done here. Thanks for listening to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also subscribe to the Fantasy Feast, Even Money, Business of Sports, and College Draft. All available at Apple Podcasts, RossTucker.com, or wherever podcasts can be found.